All right, gang, we're back now with the second half of my conversation with Brother Fab Young. He's about to drop a lot of wisdom. He's going to walk us through the entirety of the Eightfold Path. Quick note before we dive back in here. Uh, Fab Young was recording from a monastery, so you may on a couple of occasions hear a few monks chatting in the distant background. Don't let that bother you too much. Here now once again, Fab Young, starting with the first element of the Eightfold Path, right mindfulness. I go back to the, the element of right mindfulness as part of the path. And mindfulness here is just a state of awareness. You're doing something and your mind and your body is there. Your mind is fully present in the here and now. And the technique they use to train in the energy of mindfulness is the breathing and the awareness of the body. This is where meditation comes in. See yourself as a battery. And mindfulness energy is how much loaded your battery is. And so the practice of being aware of the breath and staying with it constantly, you develop a kind of concentration. This is where right concentration comes in. Your mind can hone in and can focus when it wants to. So these are the two energies that are fundamental to our training. If you can maintain and hold on to an idea, to your anger, to your whatever it is, something will come up. So when you're aware that mm, there's anger in me and you can hold it without going to eat or changing the subject or getting out of the room, going for a drive, sit still. And if your energy of mindfulness and concentration is well developed, you can see that anger and where the cause comes from. And you have insight. You have right insight. You right view about it. So you no longer see that it's just them or that person causing it. There's many other conditions. And right insight usually opens up. It doesn't tighten. It releases a knot. So a lot of ideas we have, a lot of things we carry, we call it internal knots. You have ideas about your wife, yourself, your son, your colleagues, and they become little knots and we hang on to them. We, neural pathways, I would call it. You keep going to that thought and the knot gets tighter. And insight has the ability to like release it. So we have those three elements. We call the three trainings. And these are the first three aspects of the Eightfold Path, right mindfulness, right concentration, and right view or right insight. Yeah. And then we have right diligence, which is really needed. Right diligence is not like showing up on time every day. Right diligence in the way the Buddha described it is very beautiful. It's a mental kind of diligence. When you recognize that something is arising that is not so wholesome, not so skillful. In Buddhism, we don't say something is bad, something is evil. We just say it's not skillful. You haven't mastered it yet. So when something comes up, it's not so skillful, it's not so healthy, it's not so wholesome, then you recognize it and you practice to bring it down. So when that arises, you know what to do with it. You have to be careful and slowly that seed, you don't well, what do you call it? water it? So in meditation, we see our mind is like the earth. You have seeds of anger, you have seeds of sadness, you have seeds of understanding, seeds of love. And all these seeds, when they rise up, you have to recognize, are they helpful? So when one that is more positive or more wholesome, helpful, cause less suffering, you recognize it, and you hold on to it, you tend to it. So you have four there elements. And on the other side of the circle, from right view, how you view the world, how you view yourself, makes how you think. So right view leads to right thinking. A wrong view about the world and about yourself leads to wrong thinking about yourself and about the world. When I say the world here is it can include the other person, your father, your mother. Anybody who's living in a family will know, you know, you, you turn to your brother, you turn to your sister, your wife, your father, your mother, and you can look and see how you view them. 
we manifest that in our head. They're not really like, they could be a totally different person the next day, but we don't allow that. But if you release and you have views, like I did about my father and it changes, then the way you think about him is very different. Right thinking. And then from right thinking, it comes out of your mouth. Right speech, whatever you think, <laughs> eventually <laughs> it will come out in a certain language or a certain noise even. So communication, right? Speech is not just uh, verbal. You know, how I slam the door, you get it, don't you? Yeah, you heard that, didn't you? Yeah. So how you speak, loving speech, how to stop yourself. And if your concentration and mindfulness energy is strong, you're very careful to use speech. And this is, oh boy, I really had to practice with this. I should tell you a story. I'm an architect and I came in the monastery. Oh my God, it's a mess. I wanted to correct and fix everything. And I loved going to meeting when it's about planning and fixing. <laughs> but I had a roommate, my older brother, and he said, you know, I noticed you really lose yourself when it comes to issues about planning. <laughs> you know, in the meeting, if I catch you and I put my thumb in my mouth like a hook, then you have to stop talking. You can't talk from then on. Because, you know, you think that, you know, I was trained an architect. I know more than you guys. So I always have the right answer and I always have to contribute. So my view of who I am and how I'm educated in architecture affected how I speak in the meeting. So any anyway, my brother one time caught me and he put his finger like a fish hook in his mouth. And I remember it was at the early part of the meeting. For the rest of the meeting, I had to sit there and I couldn't share anything. Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> growing up in the West, when you hear ideas and you want to contribute, it was tough, you know. So anyway, that's right speech. Right speech is not always about speaking the right thing or what is right. Right speech is knowing yourself and compensating because you're victorious, not because you speak. You're victorious because you are not a slave to the way you have been cultured. <laughs> that was so liberating for me. That's the kind of spiritual happiness that I'm talking about. When I speak of happiness, these are the happiness of the training. And then you move from right speech to right action. It's even more complicated and more subtle. So there's a lot of very biased things under our speech and our action. That's why we slow down. We learn to stop. I remember learning to be quiet, not to make noise with things around me. And when we eat, it was a training as a young monk, not to make noise. You begin to see many things from action. When I see a brother stand up and how he stands up tells me a lot because I have trained in that. And so you become more aware when you enter the room, your body, your energy, how you sit down. Anyway, is a uh, right action. And then it moves into right livelihood. And I think you're discovering this is why, you know, I, I wanted to talk to you because it's like, wow, you, you're on the path. Because <laughs> now you're, you're finding a, a livelihood that is uh, in line with your heart, I feel, I sense, from just doing what people tell you you should be doing out of fame or whatever. Now you, you have intention now. <laughs> and that's right livelihood. When you do something, and for me, particularly, is to serve, to help. It is just amazing. That is right livelihood. For me, that's the thing we need to teach young people, that we need to have a different view about our purpose in the world. We educate people as to become workers. Society, collectively, we're just preparing people for salary and we forget to actually teach people to find that calling for themselves. And this is, you know, related to your endeavor to increase happiness, even if it's 5% or 10%. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to 
be less interactive. That was quite, uh, it's hard to share a full path briefly. <laughs> so apologize. You did great. It, it, no, 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 no need for apologies. So that You did a great job. It is hard to, that's a lot. And you did it in a very helpful way. And especially appreciate how you add in how you've applied it in your own life. Let me just close by bringing it full circle. As we talked about at the beginning of this conversation about how one can orient oneself toward the world and in particular a world that's sort of dominated by capitalism and materialism, which can have some nice aspects, creature comforts aspects, but it could also have some pernicious impacts in terms of the climate, in terms of the epidemic of loneliness. And so, and you said that sometimes if you introduce the, <laughs> this kind of against the stream message too early, people can get triggered and they, you get into their opinions and their hot takes, et cetera, et cetera. But if I understand correctly, and I hope you will correct me if I'm incorrect here, that this Eightfold Path is designed, in part at least, to help us walk the middle path between being utterly abstemious and totally reclusive and rejecting everything about society or being completely caught up, on the other hand, and fully stuck in a materialist mindset and thinking that's the only route to happiness, that this Eightfold Path is a way to help us interact with the world with maximal wisdom and skill. That's right. This is the path of awakening, path of becoming more aware of yourself and how the world works. That's just basically it. Your happiness is linked to your view of self and your view of others. <laughs> and you see that is also the cause of suffering. You see, so happiness and suffering is very related. So the path helps an individual. And if we come together collectively, we can contribute more light more awareness, more correct or open view about the world. And that's why I'm, I'm happy to sit with you and contribute whatever that I have found helpful. And I, I hope it's been helpful. It has been. It's been a pleasure as well. So big thank you. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being out there, Dan. We need People like you, you uh, <laughs> in the monastery, we're always praying for people out there who are, don't look like us, <laughs> who are in the trenches, but awaken in the sense of having good intentions. Thank you.